Hi, welcome back to our series on data structures and algorithms. This is uh, our second lesson in our first unit. We are currently working our way through developing a system that will allow us to analyze the speed that an algorithm performs at. And specifically, we're looking to determine that speed uh, as a function of the number of data points in some sort of data structure. And we want to look at how does the speed of the algorithm change as the size of that data structure changes. So before we move on to what I want to go to, which is a new way of describing this speed. In the last lesson, we looked at trying to count every single statement or computation that an algorithm makes. And that was quite painstaking, um, mathematically laborious. Uh, and, and we're going to find that at times that might even not even be possible. And it's really not necessary. So we're going to be trying to move in this lesson from the T of N function for the total number of computations is something different. But before we do that, let's review how we counted the steps in an algorithm. Uh, I want to look at an algorithm that's a little less silly. The ones in our last lesson were just kind of made up. Um, this one here would actually kind of do something. Uh, let's, let's take a look at it. This algorithm is a method, which I'm just calling function. Okay, it takes a parameter, which is an array of events. Now, before we go through and analyze this algorithm, let's take a second to try and practice reading the algorithm and deciding what it does. And we do that usually through recognizing the algorithm because we've seen it before or simply tracing it. So let's start with tracing this algorithm. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an array called result that is the same length as the parameter. All right, so we could imagine that we have an array R. So let's, let's go ahead and do that. So let's, you know, let's keep it small. So let's pretend that the array R is the numbers three, two, um, how about four, and one. All right, so we're going to make a result array. And it's going to be the same length as R. When you create an array, this will actually be, if there is n elements in R, then this new array would take n computations because we have to set each one of these values to zero, one at a time. So it'll be zero, 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 zero. All right, so that's the first part. We're going to create a loop here. We're going to count from an index of zero all the way through the length of the array. And we're going to create a variable called val. Then we're going to loop again. And we're going to start at zero. We're going to loop through, loop, loop through the length of the array again. And we're going to increase value by the array's position times i plus k, the sum of i and k. So let's do that. All right, so we're going to start with, um, all right, let's start with i at zero. And that makes val start at zero. And let's take a look at looping through the array. So val would be, first we're going to take r bracket k, which when k is 0, that value is 3. And we're going to multiply that times i plus k. All right, so we're going to be multiplying that times 0 plus 0. All right, next, we're going to loop again, and we're going to increase val by r bracket k, 
Now K is the two, is going to become a 1, so we'll be taking the value of 2. All right, so what we're looking at now, we got uh, R bracket 1, which gave us a 2, and I'm going to multiply that by K plus I. Well, K is now a 1, and I is still a 0, so it'll be 0 plus 1. And then we're going to do the number 4, because that's the next value, when k is a 2. So it'll be plus 0 plus 2. And then lastly, when k is a 3, we'll be doing 1 times 0 plus 3. All right, so we don't need to go through this every step of this algorithm as detailed as we do there because I think we can see the pattern. That it looks like that the result that goes in the ith position here is going to be the first number times the sum of i and k, second number, third, and third number, etc. So we ought to be able to just kind of figure out this pattern. The first result here is going to be 0, plus 2, plus 8, plus 3. So that's 2, 10, 13. So that's going to go in the first number. All right, let's take a look when i is equal to 1. Well, I think if you think about the pattern here, since k starts over 0, this is going to be 3 times 1 plus not 2 times 1 now, but 2 times 2. And then we're going to add 4 times 3. So we're just continuing this going up by 1 more that we multiply by each time. Except for instead of starting at 0, now we're going to start at 1. All right, so this becomes 3, 7, 19, 23. If I did my math right, and it's really not that important if I didn't. All right, well, when i is equal to 2, we're going to be having 3 times 2 is 6, plus 2 times 3, which is 6, plus 4 times 4 this time, which is 16, plus 1 times 5, which is 5, so that's going to be 12, plus 16 is 28, 33. All right, lastly, when i is equal to 3, when i equals 3, we're going to have 3 times 3 this time, so that's 9. 2 times 4, which is 8. And then we'll be doing the third number 4 times 5, which is 20. And then we'll be doing 1 times 6 which is 6. All right, and that gives us 17, 37, 43. And it's kind of a neat little pattern going on there, and I bet you can figure out why if you just play with the algorithm a little bit. Okay, so that's result. Okay. All right, next we have another loop. This time we're going to copy it back over to... In, uh, that should probably say copy back over to R. Let me fix that. That's just a comment there. Okay, so we're going to copy this back over to the original array R. So this function is actually going to change the array that's sent to it. So from n equals 0 through the array length, we're just going to be copying it over. So R will lastly, one at a time, become these values. And changes made to an array in an algorithm are permanent. So the user of this method, the caller of this method, will end up with a new set of numbers in their array, that whatever array they send to this method. And that's how this function works. Okay, next let's get on to doing the counting of the steps. All right, so we discussed that the length of r, r.length, is, is in. Okay, we're going to call that in. We're going to describe the number of steps that this 
algorithm takes as a function of n. So right off the bat, we have n steps because we've got to create that empty array. Next, we have a for loop. Okay, the first we create a variable to count with, that's going to happen one time. Then we need to check our variable, and if you remember from last time, this is actually going to happen n plus one times, based on the fact that i starts at zero, we're going to loop while i is less than r dot length. r dot length is n, so it's going to be true n times, but then it will do it one more time when it learns that it is false. So that's actually going to happen n plus one time. Okay, next we have the I++. Plus plus. This occurs, this changing of our variable to count with, it happens after the code in this curly braces are run, which are only run when I is less than R dot length, what I underlined here in red, is true. So this last time on the N plus one time when it is false, we won't get an I++. Plus plus. So that's only going to happen in times, not in plus one. Okay, now we need to handle what's inside the loop. Okay, so um, everything in here is going to happen in times. So I'm just going to say plus in times everything that's going to be inside there. Well, we're going to create a temporary variable val. So that's a one time. We're going to do another loop. Int k equals zero. We'll We'll declare that one time. k less than r dot length. That's going to happen in plus one times. I think we've seen that before now a few times. And the k plus plus will happen in times. Then we got to add to that everything that happens in here, which will happen in times. So I'm using a lot of colors here, I know. But trying to get these things to match up. Well, what, how many statements is this? Well, that's just one statement. And then we have one last statement, result i is equal to val. That was back inside that outer for loop, like so. Okay, then we come down here to the end, and this is, this is not too bad. This is going to be one more. This is n plus one. That'll happen n times, and then this stuff in the middle will happen n times, and that's just one statement. So um, let me just go ahead and go to a new line here, and I'll say plus 1, plus n plus 1, plus n, plus n times 1. Okay, so we have... Our expression here kind of expanded out. We just need to do some algebra to get this all combined. So I'll add these ends. n plus n plus n. That's three n's. Uh, four n's, five n's, six n's. Okay, so I've got six n plus I've got one, two, three. Four, okay, so plus four. Plus, now we got to handle this thing inside these parentheses. Well, and we have an n times one, two, three, four. So we got uh, plus four in there. And how many n's do I have inside that blue brackets? I have one, two, three. So three n. So three n plus four. All right, super. So that gives me 3n squared plus 4n plus 6n. 4n plus 6n is 10n. And then plus 4. And there it is. That's our function. This is our t of n function. So what's important to realize is that as the number of items in the array R that we pass to this method increases, we're going to have a quadratic increase in the number of steps.
So let's just briefly look at a sketch of what this might look like. So we know that we had a, a t of n function that had four, which means we're going to have four steps even if we don't have any values in that array, if the array is of length zero. And it's going to increase like a parabola. Something, I don't know, kind of like this. So as the number of data items in our array increases, this expression for the amount of work the algorithms have to do, this t, you can see that it's going up faster and faster and faster. So for a small array size, probably not going to be too many steps. But as you get into bigger and bigger and bigger arrays, not only is it going to take more and more work, but the change in that amount of work is going to be faster and faster and faster. There's a bigger difference between the first, you know, uh, an array of size 100 to, to 200 versus 1,000 to 1,100. We're having that, we're squaring that effect, getting a faster and faster rate of change in the time that it takes to complete this algorithm. Okay, what is so important about this was the fact that it was a parabola. If I change this 4 to a 3, what difference is that really going to make? Well, you know, I would argue not much. What's important is the shape that it's in. I would even go so far as to say that this 10 of n is not that important either. What's really important is that the biggest term here was n squared, which makes me think that we really probably could just focus on maybe the degree of the resulting polynomial or the type of function that results for trying to do this analysis, and maybe we could save ourselves a lot of time. And that's exactly what we're going to do with the remainder of this lesson. We're going to look to save time, but first we need to learn a little bit of math. So let's uh, set this aside for a second, and let's learn something called Big O. All right, so I want to start with a uh, definition. All right, so I'm going to say that some function f of x is equal to O of another function g of x as x approaches infinity. If there's some constant we'll call m and a value x sub 0 that f of x is less than or equal to m times g of x, for all x greater than x sub 0. So let's really try and take this a piece by piece here. This is a complicated definition. We need to make sure that we understand. Okay, so I've got a simple example for us first. Then we'll come back and look at that previous function that we just came up with. So uh, we've been dealing a lot with n, and we'll go back to that. But let's just stick with x since it's what we use in the definition. So I'm going to start with a function f of x. And I'm going to say that uh, f of x is equal to 3x plus, so I'm going to say that f of x is equal to 3x plus 17. Put x right there. All right, so we're going, our goal is to try and find a g of x that fits this definition. So as x goes to infinity, there's some constant m and a value x sub 0 where f is below m times g of x for all x after it. All right, well, let's just suppose that that g of x were the linear function g of x equals x. Would that possibly be something that would work for this? Well, if g of x could be just a function x, then there has to be some m that I can multiply g by. Well, since f is 3 times x, let's see if f of x, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on a just a gut feeling here that if I let m be 4, that this will work. 
Okay? So we're going to let m be 4. It just it makes sense because, you know, 4 is more than 3, right? So we're asking here, is, is 3x plus 17 uh, less than 4 times x? Well, to help us answer this question, let's go ahead and look at a graph. Okay, I've got a graph here for us to look at. And it here in blue, th this is... This is the 4x that, that we are talking about. So it's our g of x of x times 4. So this is 4 times our g of x, okay? And this here in red, I'll use red to label it, that's our original f of x. So you can see that at the beginning, though, you were trying to show that f of x is less than 4 times g of x. Clearly, that's not, a, that's not the case here. I mean, this starts at 17. This one starts at 0. But if you look over here, once we reach an x value of 17, something very important happens. After that, the blue line goes up. Well, the, So the question is, is that okay? Well, let's look in. Let's look at our definition. It says that there's some x value, x naught, where f is less than n times g everywhere after it for all the x's after it. So I just need to let my x naught, so let's add that to our little statement here. So I just need to say, and we're going to let x naught equal 17. And so we were able to show that we could pick an m value and an x value where this is the case. And I would argue that we could show that for any function f of x equals ax plus b, we could figure out an x naught as a function of b and m. Uh, we could figure that out by just letting it be one more than the uh, a value. And it would be pretty much the same thing every time. So what I'm actually going to think is that it's, I think this g of x equals x is a perfectly good g of x for all functions f of x at this time. So for this case here, what we're going to say is that f of x equal to 3x plus 17 is actually equal to O of x. So O of X means that it is that it is it follows this rule that that X function in the middle here, I can somehow multiply it by a value and it'll be higher than F of X after some point if I multiply it by a big value. And so we call this big O. Okay? Big O. So we say that 3x plus 17 is equal to big O of x. Now that we've seen that with a simple example, let's go back and try it with our previous one. All right, so I've got a graph here in Desmos, the uh, desmos.com, really nice online calculator. Check it out if you haven't already. And here was the t of n function we found for our kind of strange algorithm that added up our arrays in that funny way and, and, and changed the array to those new values. So I want to figure out if we can find a g of x, or in this case a, a g of n, um, that would suffice for this function in big O. And we talked earlier how it seemed like the n squared was what made this, everything about it so important. It's what made that curved shape. So, let's try n squared. All right, well, that's obviously quite a bit lower on this interval, and it looks like it's going to stay that way, but, you know, this has a 3 in front of it. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to try and graph some different multiples of it. Well, earlier we had a 3 and we chose a 4. Let's do the same thing. Okay, so the, the green line definitely goes past and above the red line at a certain point. Uh, it appears it's happening it's around 10.3-ish, right? But at that point, afterwards, that green line is going to always be above. And we, we can prove this rigorously uh, with math and some calculus, but I think we're fine with just looking at this graphically right now. 
So we found an X naught, you know, so for, you know, for any in value, I guess since we're using in instead of X, for any in value like at 11 or more, we were able to find a number M that if we multiply G by it, we were above the other function. This, this function is less than it. So I'm going to make the claim that, we'll go back up here to our work from before, I'm going to make the claim that our function that we figured out, our T of N function is actually equal to O of N squared. We're not saying that T of N is equal to N squared. We're saying that it's equal to O of N squared, meaning that we are able to find something we can multiply by it. We are able to find an X value or N value as it is, uh, where after that N value, N squared times some number is always above it. So what we're really saying is that the, the T of N function can be bounded by some multiple of n squared. Let's look at some other O n values and see if we can't see some kind of patterns for how they work. So to do that, I'll go back to Desmos and we're just going to look at some different values. So what if something is O of n? Well, what is that? Okay, well, you can see that it's really going to be changing. And re remember, this O in is what we're saying is we're saying that the rate that it increases is linear. Okay, could be that it's it's you know the, for a particular algorithm, it could be that we need a twenty n, and you can see that it's actually going up quite a bit faster than when it was just a single n. But what's important is that the change is. Is, is constantly changing by the same rate. You know, the, the change in the amount of calculations from n equals 5 to n equals 10 is the same amount of change from n equals 10 to n equals 15. All right, let's take a look at another value. What about if I had, you know, in 01? Well, that's a constant, and, and it looks almost like zero here. A constant function, it's not saying that it's going to be only one step. Maybe, you know, in reality that you know, 500 steps. But what it's saying is that there, when you have a constant, a big O of a constant, that the time that this algorithm is required to work doesn't change as the number of data points increases. Here I am increasing from 10 uh, and on up, and you'll notice that, you know, in a constant function, because it's flat like that, we don't have any change in the calculation time. We really like algorithms like that. That's great because then we could have a million data points. We could be looking at all of the users of some big online website and organizing them or whatever we need to do. And it doesn't matter if it's a small little website or a big little website with lots of users. It's going to take the same amount of time. That's a pretty cool algorithm. Obviously very rare. We also don't mind algorithms like this. So that as the as users join our program and as the size of our data set or whatever we're trying to do with our data increases, that it's a very reasonable change in the uh, rate that it goes up. But then we can do better than that. We can actually do something called log in. Now this is this one's really nice. I'm going to have to zoom in to, to kind of show it. What this is showing is something that is as you increase the values of your data points, the increase is less than the increase when it was constant. And you see the constant is going up faster. This logarithm function, let me put it, look at it that way, you can kind of see it a little bit better, that the, you know, it, once you get past one data point, in this logarithm function, it just really flattens out. So it's not as good as a constant. You know, obviously, a constant is the best, but you can see that it is really growing slowly, very slowly than the uh, the linear values. Well, let's take a look at uh, some more. We earlier we had um, we had the O of n squared, and you can see that's a big difference. 
That's a big difference right there. Look at how much faster this is changing versus the constant. And if I make it in cubed, even worse, right? Even worse. But there is some things. Let me go back to a kind of a more reasonable window size here. Let's, let's take values up to 100 and then... Yeah, you could see right this little blue line here is is O N. Wow, is it growing super slowly uh, in squared? Remember, this could be the time it takes for this algorithm to be completed. Uh, an algorithm of O N increasing the number of data points is not drastically changing the time it takes to complete. O of N squared, mm, yeah, it is. O N cubed, that's uh, just horrible, right? Well, we're going to find that there's a lot of algorithms that are very important to us that run in what's called in log in time. And that is you're taking, instead of in squared, it's more than in because we're multiplying it by something that is more than a constant. But it's less than in squared. And you'll notice it's just a little bit above that constant. You know, the further out, the, 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 the more drastic it'll be. You know, you'll see they'll start to get some separation in their growth rate there. Uh, but if you're given a choice between an algorithm that's in log in versus an algorithm that's in squared, whew, there's no comparison, is there? Which one you would prefer? And, you know, while we're here, let's, let's have a little bit of fun. There is a couple of algorithms, brute force algorithms, that are in factorial. Um, now, you can ignore this. Desmos gives us the full factorial function are there, but just looking at the positive value, I think you could see that that is horrid, right? I mean, it's just, it's it's awful. And I I can't really even, to, to make this thing fit, uh, wow, I would have to really expand out that Y value. Uh, let's try, um, you know, 10 million. Oh, it, yeah, okay. Uh, here's the end kid. It's, it's just straight up. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, okay, all right, that's not going to work. Let's, you know, end of the 24th power. Okay, yeah, forget about it, right? And then that's just at 23 data points. And we're going to see that if you have an algorithm that runs an in factorial time, uh, you wouldn't, even the fastest computer in the world wouldn't be able to complete it in the amount of time before the universe dies some sort of heat death or the sun eats away your computer as it expands. So, yeah, we, we want to avoid this one, but unfortunately we will see it come up every so often. Um, and, you know, it's a big problem. So that's, that's big O in a nutshell. The ability to determine whether a function is O in, O in long in, O in squared, is to find the T of N function. And then go from there to find the O of it. But we'll learn that we can use some shortcuts. We can see some patterns. But, you know, when there's a loop within a loop, it could be in squared. But be careful. Figure out big O of a function is not as simple as just simply counting loops or multiplying loops. It doesn't work that way. you got to look at it carefully.